Welcome, all pregnant families, midwives, or birth workers. This is Tracy Anderson Askew, your host for the Transform Your Birth podcast, changing your mind about birth one story at a time. Each week, we will be exploring a birth story through the lens of what birth can teach us. I'll be digging deep into each story so you can learn what it is that can change the way a birth unfolds. We can't control birth, but we can influence it. So listen in to find out how. Enjoy. Sarah shares her experience of having an induction. Her body responded to the first stage and she was able to do the rest of the birth without need for any further intervention. She cites the support of her partner as being the biggest game changer for her as he coaches her to use her breath and soften her hands. She also has some interesting things to say about the pain of labour. Well worth tuning into as we learn more about what moves the needle in birth. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. This episode has been brought to you by Transform Parenting, an organisation that provides courses, coaching and community from pregnancy through to the first seven years of a child's life. Most of the stories you will hear through this podcast are graduates of the Transform Your Birth workshop held in Canberra. Our Transform Your Birth Today course is now available to anyone, anywhere, at any time and includes all the wonderful wisdom of this course and live weekly catch-ups when you need it with our host, Tracy. For a little taste, please accept our pregnancy gift offer, which contains free the first few lessons and some essential wisdom for pregnancy. The link can be found in these show notes or visit transformyourbirth.com.au. And now for the episode. Hello, everybody. It's another week with the Transform Your Birth podcast, and I'm so very happy to be back with you again this week. I have the lovely Sarah, who has a 10-week-old baby called Aurora on her. So if you hear little baby sounds, you'll know what they are. We like (laughs) to keep it real on the podcast, and it's the nature of the game. Thank you, Sarah, for coming on. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. All right. Now, you were pregnant with Aurora. How were you feeling, and what sort of preparation did you do? Uh, Throughout the entire pregnancy, I was a bit apprehensive I guess are a bit nervous about birth and the experience and what to expect which really is what led me to do the transform um, parenting course Um, but I I guess it was just the fear of the unknown and and not Mm. knowing what to expect you know hearing lots of different stories both the good and the bad and not knowing what my experience was going to be so as the as I approached um, the final stages of my pregnancy I really started to feel a little bit more anxious I guess um, but was able to to almost turn that into curiosity towards the end um, which actually made me a little bit excited for the big day so (laughs) which is funny to go from the start of the pregnancy really being I guess scared or anxious to give birth to to being excited yeah it's it's a really um tricky one is because we all know as women going to have a baby it doesn't matter if it's your first second third fourth or more you know you're about to walk into the mystery. And so that anxiety, that trepidation is well-founded because we don't know what's ahead and we know we can't control birth, but we do learn to influence it. And that's something that you would have done in the course. So can you recall then what did you learn that helped you to start to feel more open and curious to the process rather than sitting in that anxiety? What shifted you? What was really interesting for me is learning that some women, not all women experience pain in labour and in birth mm-hmm. and that it's, it, ultimately we shouldn't really be referring to it as pain. It's, it's a sensation or it's a, a wave or a feeling. Um, and I guess that kind of started to shift my mind frame from thinking, right, I'm going to absolutely be in pain. This is going to be horrible. This is going to be a really bad experience mm. to, well, I don't know how it's going to actually feel. I don't know if it's going to be pain. And I know that at the end, I'm going to have this beautiful, amazing gift that I've been waiting for this entire pregnancy. Um, so I was able to, I guess, kind of, yeah, that's really what helped me to, to shift it from there. Mm. I'll tell you why we don't in the course use the word pain. And that's because pain is a word to indicate that something's wrong in the body. And so it's there to alert us. But in labor, it's the opposite. It means everything's progressing. And so I often encourage women to start to shift the way that they think about the pain to using other language, which I think personally are more accurate. And it can be intense tightenings, pressure, 
and it can be painful, but rather than getting hooked into the idea that the pain is a problem, see the pain as one step closer to meeting your baby, as just part of that process of moving forward and progressing through your labour. So the goal is by reframing the way we think about the sensations it can often change the way we experience it. Our body responds to the words and images you give it. So when you think differently, you often experience the labour differently. Just, I will get into your birth story, but as you go and think back to the sensations you had in labour, can you just give us a brief description as to what the reality of that was? Yeah, I absolutely wouldn't categorise it as pain. Um, yeah, right. I wouldn't categorise any of the, the experience as pain. I would definitely agree that there were some intense periods, mm. um, especially with um, moving f- um, with how quickly I suppose things progressed yeah um, but it, it it's just unlike anything I've ever felt before I think intense but just a, an amazing experience mm, interesting so for those listening Sarah's very right you don't know how you're going to experience it the mistake other women make is that they think because they experienced it a certain way, that's how everybody experiences it. And if they say they didn't experience it like that, they've either forgotten or they're lying. <laughs> but really, when you look at all the different, um, where I show people the pain continuum, all the different versions of how women experience it, it helps us to realize that there's more in the buffet than just it's going to be bloody awful and painful, that Actually, birth can be orgasmic. It can even be ecstatic. So what that shows you is that there's a lot of possibilities and it's about opening our mind to those possibilities. So tell us, Sarah, coming up to the day, how did it unfold for you? Yeah, so our little girl wanted to hang in there. Didn't It wasn't too keen to come along um, anytime soon. So we ended up uh, going into hospital and having an induction at 40 weeks and 12 days. Uh Um, So leading up to that moment, I was, I I never saw my birth going the way of an induction. Um, So I was a little bit nervous when we started having that conversation and I was actually scheduled in to be induced. Mm -hmm. And I had lots of conversations with my partner over the weekend uh, before about what that, what the induction might look like, my concerns, my fears, um, and how ultimately I didn't want it to change how I wanted my, my birth to, to look like. So I was heading into the hospital on the Monday, very nervous, <laughs> not sure what to expect. Yeah. Um, fortunately for me, as the induction process kicked off, it kind of just kick-started uh, labour. So we, we were told to prepare for three days for the induction process to go through each stage um, before things actually progressed into active labour and baby actually came along. But it happened much quicker than that, which I think is what kind of helps um, helps the process. But we went in at five o'clock on the Monday, um, and she was born the five o'clock on the Tuesday, five a.m. Wow. on the Tuesday. So it was really twelve hours uh, in total. Wow! So uh, yeah, it That's was pretty, pretty amazing. Cool. Just for those listening, to, it's our current induction rates are up around almost 50% of first-time mothers are being induced. And that's an interesting statistic that has increased dramatically over the time I've been doing this work. And it's not leading to better outcomes for mums and babies. It's actually meaning that babies are spending more time in NICU and needing extra help on the other side. And so when it comes to making a decision around having an induction, for Sarah, she was right at that pointy end of the 42 weeks. So coming to that sort of level, it, you know, it's it's time to start to think about helping this baby to come. But for those of you listening, it's important that when making a decision to have an induction, you look at the risk that's being presented, but you also look at the risk of actual induction because there can be risks. And we certainly know the riper a woman is, the more successful inductions can be. Now, there's three stages for the induction process. One is some type of ripening agent on the cervix, um, or it can be a balloon. If there's a bit of separation, they might just try and force open the cervix a little bit with a, a balloon. 
The second is to break your waters, to bring the baby down solidly on the cervical door, which the more pressure that baby puts on, the more likely you are to stimulate oxytocin release and then those contractions. And if that doesn't kick it, kick it off, we go into the Sinto, which is a cannula with synthetic oxytocin designed to make your uterus contract. So there's three stages, Sarah. Did you? It sounds like you only needed the first stage. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's right. So we started off with, um, they, they referred to it as the tape, <laughs> the tape, first stage. Yeah, yeah. So we started off with the tape uh, and things really progressed from there um, mm. and we, we didn't require any further intervention from there. So we were very that fortunate. That was enough. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's a really important point. If any of you are facing induction, if step one or even step one and two kick off those contractions, you don't necessarily need to go to that third state of the synthetic oxytocin, which can be very hard on the mother's body. Um, you can just see how the labor progresses from there and give it a bit of time to kick in and start to open the door because one or one and two can be enough to kick off labor. So you were lucky with just that. So they yes. didn't try and break your waters early on or did they let that happen naturally? No, they didn't. In fact, I I'm not sure uh, at what stage the waters even broke. I think when we were in the, the second the stage, they were saying that the waters were still intact. So, <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's very fortunate. So yeah. when, when you started to get contractions, describe what that was like. Yep. They inserted the tape and it, it brought things on quite quickly. Mm -hmm. So the contractions were quite intense from the start with not a lot of space between um, as a bit of a break, which is not exactly how I had originally envisioned the, the, the birth to go. So it was a bit of a shock for me at first, I think. Um, but from there, thing, we did have a bit of a break before things ramped up again and really got into the active stages of labour. Uh, but they were, they were quite intense. Um, yeah, I think that's the only way. I can really explain intense and fast. <laughs> so what sort of things did your partner do or you do to find comfort through that? So, I mean, leading up to the birth, my husband and I had had lots of discussions about what I wanted to, um, what I wanted my labour to look like, of course, maintaining flexibility and, and understanding that it doesn't always go to that mm. plan um, and when I would need his intervention and when I would need support from him um, if we did require anything else. So really having him there holding my hand and reminding me to breathe and loosen up during each co contraction was the biggest help for me, especially yeah. at the beginning when it became so intense, so sudden. Yeah. I was kind of taken away because I was, wasn't was expecting it to happen so quickly uh, and him just standing there reminding me uh, of what we had discussed, reminding me to focus on my breathing really kind of helped to bring me back to, to what I wanted that process to look like. Wow. Tell me more about the breathing. How did the breathing change it for you? So with the sudden intensity of the contractions, I kind of held my breath and, and clenched up really tight and kind of shut down almost. And he would remind me to open my hands and to focus on my breathing, breathe through my nose um, to try and, I guess, bring myself back into almost control of my body, but also surrendering to the contractions and not, not trying to tighten up or intensify them yeah. anymore. Yeah, that's that's gold right there because contractions by their nature cause us often to tense because any time you're getting, you know, distinct pain like that or sensations, your first response is often to tense up. And so to work against that uh, reflex takes conscious effort. When you did that, how did that change your sensations? Are you aware of... Were you aware of them making it easier or were you, was it just helping you to get it get through? What what shift did that make when you've when you worked with your breath and, and really tried to loosen your body and not tense up? It really just helped me to get through um, each contraction and as I could feel them coming on just to remind to, to remember that it will pass. Mm. It kind of not not get caught up in that thought process of it's going to be like this forever. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. just that it will come and it will pass. Yeah, nice. And so that's what you were doing with your mind. You're focusing on mantras like that. Are you aware yes. of doing anything else with your mind while you were in labour? Not at, no. <laughs> I mean, it was quite 
sudden and intense. So I, I'm sure there was lots of other things on my mind, but I just remember having my husband standing next to me, r- reminding me to breathe, holding my hand, but, but keeping my hand open and my fingers loose um, and just trying to encourage me to stop tensing up. <laughs> yeah, that's a really interesting one there. Um, sometimes people are coached to squeeze, to squeeze things like combs and balls. And I've heard women say that that's really helped them. Um, What Sarah's describing there is sort of more of the approach that I tend to encourage my, the women that I'm working with is to relax because Mm -hmm. tension travels, it travels through the body. Tension in the jaw will um, create tension between the legs, like the law of the sphincter. Tension in your hands can create tension in your shoulders, in your back, and, of course, that can travel as well. So opening your hands and resisting that urge to squeeze seemed to help. So what was it like? Were you aware of hitting transition, that next phase, where just before the pushing phase? What was that like? Yeah, it's so amazing. I I was always really most nervous about transition with labor and with birth because I had heard it has such a in again using the word intense (laughs) intense reaction on a woman's body you know with the shaking and the temperature changes and things like that so I was really nervous about that the most when I I feel I had a bit of a different experience with transition it was almost as I hit that point I rolled over and was instantly focused on my breathing and knew that she was almost here it was almost over it was it was about to it was about to all be done I was about to have my baby girl that I had been waiting for 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 so long so I think for me that transition stage was a completely different experience to what I had anticipated where I had thought it would be horrible painful you know something that I have to overcome for me it just became like flicking a switch instantly being able to go calm go into my body and utilize that next stage of contractions to start focusing on pushing and bringing her into the world that's really interesting were you aware you were in transition how did you know I didn't know until I had the discussion with my husband and and the mid my student midwife afterwards, where we sat down and had a bit of a debrief. Yeah. And and my husband said to me, he thinks that's really where that that transition came in, because he just saw a complete change. It was just, and that was the start of that second stage, and that was the the start of, yeah, progressing, I guess, into motherhood from there. Interesting. It's a great example of being mindful not to take into your birth any preconceived ideas about how you experience something. We can hear other people's stories and think, oh, gosh, that sounds hard. I don't know how I'd go with that. And you just don't know how it's going to be for you. So your transition, that whilst the people around you probably noticed it, it sounded like it was a fairly quiet transition. It was, yes. Mm, Interesting, very interesting. Transition is that, period between opening the door of the cervix so that it's fully open which then we know that the baby can come out of the uterus and it's kind of like the last couple of centimeters and so it goes from being a little bit predictable to a bit unpredictable and it's often the time women start to externalize or want to get off the boat (laughs) they get a little bit edgy they ask for the drugs it's often the time you can't have the drugs and so it is, it's a change in that labor as the woman's starting to sense that there is a change and there is a genuine change because the baby's starting to come into the birth canal and get getting her ready to push. So that's the, the stage of transition. That's interesting. So tell us about second stage, Sarah. What was that like for you? It was, the baby out? yeah, second stage for me was quite a long experience. I knew at the time it was, taking a while but obviously had no concept of the actual time itself Um, but I really enjoyed the second stage and I say this to anyone that I talk about my birth experience because it allowed me to actually utilize the contractions and the intensity to do something with it to be Mm. able to utilize that to push to be able to progress things along it did take two and a half hours in the end which Mm. is quite long um for some second stages um, because her presentation was um, compound so she had her hand near her head so every time she inched forward she would you know we'd have two steps back but it was still my my favorite part of the whole process because I actually had some form of 
I guess, control and it felt really empowering to be able to utilise those contractions to progress things along. That's interesting. I've heard other women describe that too, say the same thing. It's like I felt like I was at the whim of the contractions, but once I got into pushing, I felt like I was driving it more. Yes. I got a very strong urge to bear down. That was a clear feeling. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yeah, and I do remember that. I remember um, even saying to the midwives at, at one stage, I just really feel like I need to go to the bathroom. I just really, you know, I just feel this intense pressure and I need to to push something. So, um, yeah, I definitely remember that sensation. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> and so tell us what it was like when she landed. It was just the most amazing feeling most amazing experience I was almost a little bit in shock um, to experience this this thing that I had been carrying inside me for such a long time and that I had been trying to envision in my mind and you know longing for for such a long time to have her here and place into my arms and place for my chest it was just the best feeling in the world I don't think anything can really compare to it yeah yeah it's incredible isn't it so and when she came out did did your partner catch her or did anything like that happen unfold uh no so we did um require some assistance of an episiotomy given the prolonged um second stage so the doctor so we did have a doctor come in to assist with that um her and our student midwife uh, caught the baby but my husband was up at my shoulders holding my hand and supporting me and I just remember the moment that she was placed on my chest just looking up at my husband and just both of us were just in tears we were just so amazed wow that's incredible so as you look back at the journey what were the things that made the biggest difference to you being able to manage that because it seems I think like it was fairly intense mm. it was yeah and I think having my husband there that where we had already talked about what are the things that I want him to say all the things I don't want him to say um in in labor and in birth and just trusting that I had him there you know talking about the things that he can do to help support me so I know that he always made sure I had I was drinking water he always made sure the water was full he always made sure he was there by my side you know even when as it happened overnight um he was trying to get some rest at one point when the contraction settled a little bit, but they picked up again in intensity. He was right back next to my side. So wow. I think that was the the most, the biggest thing, having that support there. Mm. And I think having conversations leading up to it was just so helpful. So he knew what to do on the day and I had complete trust in him. I didn't need mm. to think about that mm. at all. Yeah. So the birth wasn't just on your shoulders. It was on both of you. Yes. And when, um, couples go through this with a very, very clear role, partners or birth support people are absolutely gold in that labour room because it enables the mother to go back into the zone of her brain where she doesn't have to think, she doesn't have to protect herself, she doesn't have to advocate for herself, she doesn't have to ask for what she needs. People are anticipating what her needs are and guiding her into different positions when that happens, we're creating really good conditions for that mother to let go and allow birth to happen and not get in the way of the process. Is that what you experienced? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what did you learn about yourself, Sarah? I learned just how strong I actually am and how strong I actually can be. It was just, yeah, to, to go through such intensity and, Uh, just how incredible the body can be to be able to create this amazing incredible being and to be able to birth it through such intensity and then to feel so amazing and incredible afterwards I was (laughs) so surprised and so amazed at how I guess it was all the all the hormones and all the the good things but just to feel so incredible afterwards it was the best experience and I've yeah, I've just felt so strong ever since. I think even amongst all the the challenges that come with having a newborn and, and transitioning in that way, I've just felt really strong and I have a really good sense of belief in myself that I really feel like I can do anything that I really set my mind to now. So it's been an eye-opener for me. There's Mother Nature's design right there. She wants yeah. us to discover that we can do this because the journey on the other side is very intense 
and yeah. it's it's fraught with having to overcome challenges, having to step up to the plate time and time again when babies wake up during the night, having to discover that we're much stronger than what we think. So as you look at that journey, can you connect then what you've learned to the parenting journey? Like how has it been for you as having a newborn? What's that been like? Having a newborn has been amazing. I have loved the the newborn experience. There's obviously always challenging moments like sleepless nights or getting up during the night or feeding issues or things like that, all of a bit of a journey. But I think I haven't doubted my ability to do it at all ever since having her. It's just felt like, okay, this there is something that needs to be done here. You know, she needs to be fed. Let's figure out how we can feed her. We need to get up in the night. Okay, she needs to be fed. She needs to be changed. You know, just that it it just feels like it's natural now. So, Mm. yeah. That's interesting. And do do you feel like you can connect it to the birth experience? Do you feel like it was relevant to the way you've taken to motherhood? May not. I've never thought about it in that way. So I guess it's a little bit um, difficult to to answer that off the top of my head. Uh, I think just the, the fact that the birthing experience allowed me to have confidence in myself that I can overcome any challenge means that any challenge we faced with her so far, I feel that I have been able to overcome or I feel that there is a way that we can overcome it. Mm. So, yeah, I think that's the the, the, the main takeaway for me. Yeah, I'm sensing that it's really fed into your confidence to overcome Um, because you had a very powerful experience of discovering what you had to overcome. Yes. I um, One of the podcasts, you for those listening, you can go back and listen to it, but I talk about how birth sets us up for parenting. And it's really interesting to think of it in those terms. I always come back to Mother Nature's Blueprint. When you look at the biochemistry of birth, when you look at the rite of passage and what it invites us to be challenged or what it invites us to discover and to um, experience, I can see the connections between that and early parenting and parenting period. Um, Becoming a parent is a massive upgrade and so having a trial by fire, if you like, process like birth is part of that system, a part of the system's need to upgrade in order to be able to attend to the needs of a newborn baby. Prior to having babies, it's all about us, you know, Um, but once we have those babies, it's got to be all about the babies. So I think personally, there's a very strong connection between the two. So I invite all of the listeners, if you've had babies, to really think about what did you learn in your birth? And how has that played out in your parenting? Now, it's not the type of birth that matters. It's what gets activated at the time. But women can be very powerfully activated through cesarean, assisted births, all sorts of different variations. But certainly the hormones are designed to help us to overcome. And they're very performance-enhancing hormones. Um, just one quick thing before we finish off, Sarah, you had an episiotomy. Now that's yep. often women's biggest fears. How was that for you? Yeah, heading into pregnancy, it wasn't on my um, bucket list. list. <laughs> yeah, I must, I must have an episiotomy. Sure. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I think even the, the doctor came in and, you know, suggested it and said things have been progressing a bit long. I think we need to consider this. And I sent her away. <laughs> she said, <laughs> Off I'll you go. Back. I said, no, <laughs> no thank you. <laughs> she said, I'll come back in 10 minutes. Um, and I'm, she did come back in 10 minutes when things hadn't progressed. And we talked about needing um, that intervention to bring her into the world. And, you know, I, I was at that point, I said, anything that will help to bring her in the world that won't harm her of course I'm I'm willing you know if you think that this is what we need this is what we need um and it was I I don't know what I was scared of at all it was so so fine and you know she came in it helped just for that final step for me to then be able to to push her out and to bring her into the world and the recovery and everything has been so fine it's it's not what I had anticipated at all and I think looking back on it now it's definitely not on a preference list, but would I do it again? Yes, absolutely. If it's going to bring her, help to bring her into the world and safely as possible, then yeah, I would do it all again. 
Of course. See, that's the mother beast. Yes. <laughs> the mother beast will do anything for her baby. And sometimes it's hard to to feel connected to that part of you earlier in your pregnancy. But by the time you get to the pointy end of almost meeting your baby, it is the last thing you're worried about. There's such bigger things going on, isn't there? Yes, absolutely. Mm. And you get very, very clear about what's important in this space. Now, if we can avoid them, obviously that's the preference. You know, you don't... Yes there was a period of time in history where they were doing them routinely to speed up the process. And that was very stupid. Yeah. Um, but in certain circumstances, it can be really appropriate. So one of the questions I would encourage you to ask your care is prior to the birth, labor day is to under what conditions would you want to do an episiotomy so that if it does come your way, you've got your head around what it involves and under what circumstances you might agree to it happening um, it's a good good little question to ask in order to get your head around that as a potential possibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what you're describing, Sarah, is what I hear most of the time. Women, at the they, they think it's a lot bigger than what it actually is at the time. There's so many other sensations and often you don't even feel it. If you do, it's yeah. very minor compared to what it is that you're experiencing at the time. So and of course, the body has a capacity to heal. And we also have incredible health professionals like women's health physios that can help us to retain and continue to um, maintain good functioning in that part of our body. So yep. beautiful. So Sarah's story is a great example of an induction that's no big deal. And isn't that lovely to hear? <laughs> I want to emphasize with her story, it was wonderful that her caregivers didn't push her to keep going through those three stages. She was able to allow the contractions that she was having just purely by that first stage of the induction and not need any extra fuss. So it's good for women who are potentially facing induction or that, that that's been um, talked about in your set of conditions to always talk about the idea of, okay, I'll agree to the first stage, maybe the second stage, but, you know, I'm hoping to do this without any extra need for fuss. So it was wonderful that you were able to do that. And, of course, she made full use of her, the support her partner gave her. She made full use of her mind, really working on her breath, letting her mind go, letting her body be soft and not resist and contract up with each of those sensations. And even though she needed an episiotomy, it was no big deal and her healing's been very good. And Sarah's also helped us to see the power of overcoming and how that set can be set up, set you up beautifully for overcoming the challenges of a newborn. Is there anything else you want to say, Sarah? No, I think just re-emphasizing it was such an amazing experience and for anyone out there that's about to experience it for the first time, just keeping an open mind about what it can look like and not listening to the, all the horror stories because yeah. you have no idea what it's going to, what's going to happen. Absolutely. And horror stories can find their way into your labor room. Yeah. But in order to do that, sometimes we need new information and new ways of framing some of those stories so that we can move forward and, and, you know, work on um, birthing in a way that's true to us and our experience rather than other people's experiences. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your time. And little Aurora, who's been so very quiet, I was expecting to have a bit of, bit of a, um, uh, her um, sharing her beautiful voice with us, but she's been very content on your breast. So she has been. <laughs> she's very happy. So thank you, everybody, for listening. And join us again next week. We'll have some more goodness for you to really help you to understand what moves the needle for birth. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe and share this podcast. This episode has been brought to you by Transform Parenting, an organisation that provides courses, coaching and community from pregnancy through to the first seven years of a child's life. It is a place where you can learn, get support and grow into your role as a parent. Why not take advantage of a special gift for all pregnant women at transformyourbirth.com.au? Or if you have children, we have a gift for parents also.